Okay. So, welcome everyone for the second session of our seminar, New Work on Roman Religion. It is my great pleasure to introduce very briefly Claudio Beltrao, who is Professor of Ancient History at the Universidad Federal del Estado de Rio de Janeiro, UNIRIO. Uh, we have been working together with her um, for a long time. It is always a pleasure to work with her. And uh, this seminar as well is, uh, is, uh, um, was organized together with Claudia. And um, she works mainly on the intellectual life of late Republican Rome, with special emphasis on the study of Roman religion in Cicero's philosophical works. She is a permanent member of the Nucleo de Studios e Referencia sobre Antiguidade e o Medioevo, and an associate member of uh, uh, the Center Anima, Anthropologie et Histoire des Mondes Antiques, in Paris, of course. Uh, among her recent publications, I, I can mention uh, the, the works edited with uh, Federico Sant'Angelo, uh, Caesar and Roman Religion, published by Franz Steiner uh, two years ago, and Statues in Roman Religion, uh, published by Coimbra University Press uh, as well in 2020. Uh, and more lately, the dossier Religious Images in the Roman World, published in uh, the open access um, journal Mythos, Rivista di Storia delle Religioni. So I hand over the, the floor to, to Claudia, um, whose, whose uh, uh, um, paper today, uh, title is uh, uh, Cicero, Divine Images and Epicurus Eidola. So the floor is yours, sure. Claudia, if you want to share the PowerPoint. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Giorgio. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Let me see, share. I suppose it's, I'm sharing, okay. Thank you. So uh, I will speak in English. Uh, because we are recording and also because this research is developing, uh, it's been developed in, 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 in English. Okay, so uh, in the quick uh, Q&A um, session, uh, you can speak in Portuguese or your language and it will be fine. Okay, so last week, Giorgio talked about the running of the Luperti and the relationship between ritual movements and religious space. Today, I will focus on a theological topic. So let's go. So, it doesn't move. Oh, my dear. No, no, Giorgio? Uh, okay. No, I will. To, uh, yeah, uh, try it again. Yes. Exactly yes. the same as before. <laughs> yes. Oh, it is. So, it moved? Moved? Uh, yes. Ah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, the Greek philosophical tradition had a long lasting debate uh, about the gods, but in, late, in the late Republic, it became lively in the Roman milieu with intellectuals such as Philo of Larissa, Antiochus, Lucretius, Philodemus, Varro, and of course Cicero. These theological questions and controversies uh, should be re-explored in their particularity, for they interacted with religious practice and beliefs. Many titles, fragments, and names of authors give us a glimpse of the intense theoretical activity on religion and theology in dialogue with Greek classical and Hellenistic thinking. It was a critical element to understand Roman, Roman cultural dynamics, giving rise to a theological knowledge, and Cicero is one of its central figures. 
some, some remarks about theology are pertinent here. In the, his Republic, Plato was perhaps the first philosopher to use theology, designating the justified opinions about the gods instead of those he considered harmful. These words slowly became popular, and Aristotle speaks of a theological philosophy, thus designating the part of metaphysics that studies the first principles of the universe. In addition, there were attempts to account for the divine elements within the natural world, as theology was considered a branch of thought linked to physics, metaphysics, and cosmology. Japan Mansfield, following the order of Balbo's exposition at Cicero's De Natura de Oro, Book Two, divided Hellenistic theological questions into three main things. The first, the existence of the gods and their attributes. The second, the divine providence and the relationships between the gods, the world, and human beings. And third, the conditions which account for the conception of the gods. These questions, which had already been addressed at least since Plato and Aristotle, grew up in relevance and sophistication, especially because of the academic controversies against the dogmatism of Epicureans and the Stoics. They also summarized the central theological questions of the Western tradition as it develops, configuring uh, the existence of the gods, their attributes and role, and the human knowledge of the divine. It should be noted that these questions about the existence, nature, and role of the gods in the world are still in the spotlight, being sometimes crucial to political and social life today. Ancient philosophy provides both reinterpretation of reinterpretations of traditional contents of religion as expressed in rituals, law, and myths, and a strong criticism of them. The knowledge about the gods is one of the principal points of Cicero's interests. In the Natura de Or, he discusses Epicurean and historic doctrines in a lively theological debate intensified by academic controversies. The disputes between Epicureans and Stoics, the two main dogmatic schools of Cicero's age, seem to have increased and invariably focused on religious issues. The Epicureans argued that they had liberated humankind from religious fear, and our sources indicate some tension between traditional religious content and their doctrine. Likewise, the Stoics also had to make their rational postulates compatible with Roman religious tradition. So this debate were not just a matter of theory, but a practical concern as, up to a point, they shaped religious and political attitudes. For a long time, the scholarly interest in the Natura de Oro was directed to the Epicurean and Stoic theologies and the new academic position. But a revival of the interest in Cicero's religious point is a bit more recent. Definitely, Cicero does not deal with religion as is often done today, per uh, perceiving religion as a vehicle for individual expression. Instead, he focused on the social life of human beings for what the people think about the gods has social and political implications. In the premium of De Natura de Oro, Cicero asserts that if the Epicureans were right and the gods would really have no interest in human life, we humans would have no reason to be pious. And without piety, justice and good social relations are in danger. However, Cicero's critique is not only directed at Epicureanism. The historic view of a divinely governed, governed and fated universe uh, undermines the idea of human agency, and it is also problematic for Cicero. Therefore, the critique of these doctrines is necessary, as Cicero states in the beginning of the Natura de Or. I have been studying the questions of, divine, of the divine images, 
especially the relationships between, for example, a divine statue, that is a material object, and the idea of divinity. In philosophical works, the links between the form and content of both statues are often discussed. And not only the nature of the gods, but also the human knowledge are in question. Today, I will focus on Cicero's critique of Epicurean theology, observing a passage from a letter to, from Cicero to Cassius, written a few months before Cicero wrote the theological dialogue De Natura de Oro, searching for clues to understand better some aspects, some aspects of Cicero's critique of Epicurean theology about how the divine images are formed in human minds. When studying Epicurean theology, or any other else, in fact, it is necessary to deal with its conception of reality. Epicurean theology does not lay in the aesthesis, that is the immediate and passive sense perception, as a, as a God is not tangible, of course, but in the prolepsis, that is preconceptions or a previous or natural notion of divinity. The Epicurean prolepsis is formed empirically, being a notion shaped by the reiteration of sense perceptions that is always faithful. In this case, the atomistic conception is the basis for understanding the Epicurean solution to the question of the gods. My point here is how the Epicureans explain the process that led to the conception of the divine form and figuration and Cicero's critique. So, Antiquipatio, Prainotio, Praesensio, and Informatione are words by which Cicero translates the Epicurean prolapses. And a res recent study by Stefano Mazo this year has shed light on the nuance, nuance of this translation. Uh, in Valais, for example, in this passage, uh, in the slide, uh, Peleus, the Epicurean, the Epicurean spokesman in the, in the Natura de Orum, had defined Epicurus prolepsis of the gods by saying, I quote, For what notion or what tribe of men is there but possesses unthought some preconception of the gods? Such notions Epicurus designate by the word prolepsis, a sort of preconceived mental picture of a thing without which nothing can be understood, investigated, or discussed. The Stoics also assert the natural origin of the idea of God, God. And in the Natura de Oro, Book 1, 2, uh, two Cicero says more prudently that almost all people think that they are gods. And he said, with nature as their guide. Duque Natura. Well, to take nature as the origin of a preconception is not the problem uh, in the polemics against Epicureanism. Epicureanism is an explicitly orthodox doctrine, and Dirk Obink correctly defined its theology as the theology of materialism. In a word, the origin of a prolapsis is material, and it is due to the accumulation of experience that are always material. Precisely through the human rational ability, the possibility of general, generalizing is decisive, creating notions and concepts. So the Epicurean doctrine strictly refers the mental processes to physical sensation. Velaeus then affirms that the existence of the God, the gods is a necessary inference, and there is a concept of the gods that generates a belief that humankind share by nature, which, it, uh, which is explained in terms of the flow of atomic images, the adola, that emerge from the surface of objects or body traveling at a very uh, high speed in the air of water and they can change along the way to our eyes, to our vision. The idol uh, are also bodies, and if the aesthetics only register their impact in the sense organs, 
they strongly connect the prolepsis with the act of the mind, creating images in our minds that can be attested or refuted by the indiscutable sensitive evidence, the Nargea. As Epicurus said in the letter to Menesius, quoted <laughs> below, uh, the Adelan, uh, the gods, for, sorry, the gods exist insofar as they knowledge, their knowledge is self-evident, in Argus. Therefore, when we talk about Epicurean Ebola, we are dealing with a fundamental epistemological issue. The relationship between vision, the object seen, and knowledge. In Epicurean doctrine, the Eidola are the very intermediaries between external objects or beings and the one who perceives them, having two main functions. The first, in mechanical or instrumental terms, they make it possible to perceive and represent external objects clearly and distinctly. Um, focusing, oh sorry, let me, let me read, <laughs> focusing on the sense organs and the mind generating impressions of the external objects from which they flow. And the second, second function, the Eidola preserve and communicate information about objects seen, such as property, size, and shape, by making our mental representation, representations correspond accurately to the objects. The Epicurean God soul are conceived as aggregate of atoms emanating Eidola, like any other living being or objects. In short, the Epicurean position emphasizes the absolute value of physical sensation as the first criterion of truth. In the empiricist epistemology of Epicurus, it, this must be accepted to be true. Even more, Lucretius, sorry, Veleius, seems to promote the idea of the Deus effigies hominis et imago, or the gods as the image and likeness of human being. And a passage is significant here when Peleus discusses the mental vision of divinity by which the human, know, the human being knows the divine form. And I, I, I quote, for the divine form, we have the hints of nature supplemented by the teachings of reason. From nature, all men of all race derive the notion of gods as having human shape and known order. For in what other shape do they ever appear to anyone awake or asleep? But not to make primary concept the sole test of all things, reason itself delivers the same pronouncements. For it seems appropriate that the most exalted being whether by reason of his happiness or eternity, should also be the most beautiful. But what disposition of the limbs, what class of features then the human form? But the human figure surpasses the form of all other living beings, and God is a living being. And God must possess the shape which is the most beautiful of all. And since it is agreed that the gods are supremely happy and no one can be happy without virtue and virtue cannot exist without reason and reason is only found in the human shape, it follows that the gods possess the form of man. Yet their form is not corporeal, but only resembles bodily substance. It, is not, it does not contain blood, but the semblance of blood. So, the gods exist. They are immortal and completely happy. Even more, gods must have sense perception, wisdom, and pleasure, and they have human, a human form, albeit a perfect human form. They have no business to attend to, no troubles, no concern, concern with human beings, living in a blessed eternity apart from any involvement with the creation or governing of the universe, which arises and is sustained by the clustering of atoms in the void. The gods have no vulnerabilities and weaknesses like humans, as they have a quasi-body and a quasi-blood. So the divine bliss and inaccessibility depend on the physical structure of the gods, 
as the, the eternal happiness is not a mere well-being, but a permanent status. Unlike other, the divine atomic structure remains eternally unchanged. And as their atoms are so light and fine in aggregates that cannot meet other atomic uh, structures, they are located outside the cosmos in intermundia that are, however, is still part of the material world. In this way, the gods are not discernible directly by the senses, but only by the mind. They are beautiful, stable, and perfect, and they have a human form, as only humans have reason. So, the anthropomorphic shape of the gods in Vallejo's argument can be compared with Lucretius, for whom the humans would have a uh, she would have seen enormous and beautiful forms in dreams to which they attributed power and eternity. That is, um, those dream views that overlap with the edola issued by the divine bodies that I quote, announce the, forms, the form of the gods. An infinite outflow of atomic images come from all parts of perfect and stable divine bodies. And there is a perfect identity of the gods themselves and their images in this world. So the gods only ever appear to our mind in human form, which is evidence for the notion of the form they actually have. And they deserve worship because of the sublimity of their perfect nature. If Cicero does not criticize the natural origin of the Epicurean notion of God, the promotion of these happy and eternal idol gods and the universality of their human form are controversial points. By Cotta's mouth, Cicero raises many questions linked to the ontological status of the Epicurean gods, their shapes and the modalities of their creation, demanding that the divine image must be distinguished from other figures and visions of the physical world. Most of his critique is linked with the role of the Eidola in Epicurean physics, as Cotta stresses in De Natura de Orum, Book 1, 105. So let now we see a relevant pass passage of a letter from Cicero to Cassius written a few months before the Natura de Or. And I read it. I think you must be a little ashamed at this being the third letter inflicted on you before I have a page or a syllable from you. But I will not press you. I shall expect or rather exact a long letter. For my part, if I have a messenger always at hand, I should write even three an hour. For somehow it makes you seem, seem almost present when I write anything to you. And that not by way of phantoms of images, and this expression is eidolon fantasias, or appearance of images or impressions of images. Well, as your new friend, David Green, expressed it, who wrote that mental pictures in the expression is the anoiticas fantasias yeah, are caused by what Catius called spectris, spectra. Yeah. For I, I must remind you that Catius in summer, the Epicurean, lately dead, calls spectris what the famous Gargetius Epicurus, and before him, Democritus, used to call images. Edula. Well, even if my eyes were capable of being struck by these spectres because they spontaneously run in upon them at your will, I do not see how the mind can be struck. You will be obliged to explain it to me when you return safe and sound, whether the spectre of you, the spectrum doom, is at my command so as to occur to me as soon as I have taken the fancy to think about you. And not only about you, who are in my heart's core, but supposing I, begun, I begin thinking about the island of Britain, will its image fly at once into my mind? So, 
the death of the Epicurean Latin writer Cassius is evoked. Cassius, the recipient, an Epicurean himself, prefers to quote Epicurus' doctrine in Greek rather than resorting to translation from the Mali Verborum Interpretes, as he said in a lot, another letter, the Familiaris 1519, which Cicero shares. Catius is perhaps, after Lucretius, the best known Latin Epicurean writer of Cicero's time, although very little is known about, is known about him. Quintilian says that he was a superficial writer, but not unpleased. While Porphyry the Scolias says that Catius wrote four books, De Rerum Natura e de Sumo Born, but we know almost nothing about him. Now, without discussing the nuances of the insubrian origins of Catius, this insubrian, insubri uh, 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 one of the main size of the Celtic groups, uh, uh, and Cassius uh, in, in the Ad Familiaris 1519, uh, Cassius qualifies Cassius as Rusticus, uh, which is a grace. Now, but the central point of the criticism is the translation of Edola by Spectra. Well, it is not worth it that Cicero repeatedly criticizes Epicurus' originality in attributing the core of his doctrine to Democritus, although Epicurus does not acknowledge his death. The Natura Deorum was written a few months after this letter and brought a refutation of Democritus' conception of images, Edola, now, which Cicero qualifies as Flagitia, the book one saying that Democritus had already been strongly criticized for his notion. For having appropriated it, the Epicureans were also the serving of criticism without de developing in what points or Epicurus doctrine differs from Democritus or not, despite Cicero calls Democritus images as simulacra and Epicurus ones as imagines in the Natura de Oro, for example, the book two. Well, in the Natura de Orum, Cotta, the academic, often emphasizes formulas like those in the letters, in the letter to Cassius. Um, formulas very precise in their ter terminology, echoing uh, Lucretius in Book 4. According to Democritus, the edula emanates from all bodies in a continuous flow. It is a material process affecting the organs of the organs of vision. And for Epicurus, the flow of the edola penetrates the eyes. Ferire, Cicero said, and they are the orange of an um, image scene. The reference to the impact on the eyes appears in the, uh, appears in the letter to Cassius and another letter from Cicero this time to Atticus, many years ago, uh, illuminates the point. Cicero talks about the renovation of his home uh, at Arpino by the architect Cyrus and comments on the Edola theory when talking about a narrow window. And he said, if our vision comes from the impact of the Edola, the Edola will have difficulty passing through narrow spaces, but this emission of rays occurs perfectly. Of course, Cicero refutes the Democritus theory in a jocular tone. The vision for Cicero does not come from the impact of the Ebola in the, on the eyes. And Cicero refers to the Catroptica or the Speculis, an optical geometric treatise attributed to Euclid. Furthermore, if Democritus was right, the narrowness of Cicero's window would create difficulties for many Edola coming from the vast outer space who would have a difficulty at reaching the eyes. In short, Cicero projects this passive role of vision as a receiver of Edola in favor of an active, active one based on Euclid and consequently on Plato's Timaeus 45 to 46, which he translates, Cicero translates. Um, and, and in this, in this, in this view, uh, 
visual rays depart from the eyes in a direct line to meet the object seen. So let us go further. Well, in 2019, a paper by Sean McConnell entitled, Why is Latin Spectrum a Bad Translation of Epicurus Egolo? Uh, elucidated this controversial step in Cicero's letter, that's his letter to Cassius, no? shedding light on Cicero's understanding of Epicurus Egolo. Before this article, three years ago, uh, few scholars had seriously considered why Cicero and Cassius rejected or even ridiculed Cassius' translation of Abelum Itum into Spectrum. And even Shackleton Bailey did not comment on this negative judgment in his authoritative edition of the Epistolae Ad Familiaris. Other relevant scholars such as Powell, Griffin, and Zetzel, for example, only note the rebuttal without further details. And they sadly, by, its turn, by his turn, comments that it was due to Cassius' attempts to create a Latin jargon for Epicureanism, saying, I quote, I have no idea what connotation it con conveyed to a Roman ear, but Cicero and Cassius seems to have found them, them comic. Even more, the tendency to translate spectrum by spectra, spectra, spectro in, in Portuguese, and so on, uh, the modern uh, better prevents the understanding of the details, as there is a very different connotation between the, 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 of, uh, the ancient term and the modern term. Okay. Well, McConnell's study begins by commenting on Dante Nardo's uh, explanation in Spectra Catiana in the 60s, 70s, which proposed four reasons for this rebuttal. The first, Spectrum was a neologism, and for Cicero, neologism should be avoided as much as possible. Second, Spectrum would not be necessary when there were Latin terms such as imago and simulacrum used by Cicero and Lucretius. Third, Catius would be a bad translation for not knowing the exact meaning of the Greek term, preventing him from arriving at a suitable Latin equivalent. And four, spectrum would be conceptually unacceptable for not expressing the relationship of similarity between the object seen and its image, as occur in simulacrum and imago. So Cassius' criticism indicates that the most important for him would be the style, evoking the opposition between rusticitas and urbanitas, which is very much in line with the discussion about style in Cicero's De Oratore. Indeed, in De Oratore 225, rustici are root of foolish people, and Cicero often criticized Latin and Greek writers as stylistically. The point is that in morphological terms, spectrum has a suffix quite usual in agri agricultural tools, so, such as aratrum or rutrum. However, for Sean McConnell, Catius' spectrum was not philosophically pertinent to translate this fundamental notion of Epicureanism about the relationship between sense perception and thought regarding the instrumental role of the Abel. On the contrary, Catius would have deliberately chosen it to emphasize the role of the Abel according to a reason, reasoning like that. You need a spectrum to see something as well. You need, um, as you need an aratum to turn the soil to stop. Furthermore, if Catius' critique of Catius' spectra is linked to this two style, Cicero critiques by his uh, its turn, despite considering the term spectrum vulgar, is not centered on style, but on its inability to grasp the similarity between the objects and its image. Nevertheless, perhaps the main reason for the criticism is that spectrum would inadequately translate the intermediary role between the external objects from which it emanates in the eyes 
that perceive it, to which um, transmits uh, information such as high shape, color, blah, blah, creating an image that becomes the object of thought. Cachos, translations, is therefore insufficient for Cicero, who does not accept a passive role to the eyes in the mind's processes and use. And in the Natura, um, use in the Natura de Oro and the Finibus and other, other works, the term imago, making it clear that he was aware that there was no exact correspondence between the two words, eidolon and imago. As we find in a fragment of Nigidius Figulus on the nature of humans, and I quote, in fact, after, find, uh, after finding out its proper matter, every art starts by collecting its tools, equipments, and implements by means of which it can accomplish its work. In a word, for Cicero, in my view, spectrum is the flower tool to express the ableist instrumental role to both sensitive and cognitive term. And in my view, the focus of the criticism is not only the fact that spectrum, spectrum the word, does not uh, express the similarity between object and the image, but on the inappropriate role that the Adola themselves would play when one thinks about, thinks about absent things, like the images of Cassius in the distant Britannia, is the, the examples in the letter, criticizing so the way in which the Epicureans explain how the Adola reached the mind. And Cicero asks Cassius to explain him this point when he comes back from Britannia. This point appears again, Tura de Oro, book one, in the, in the slide, when Cotta replies to Veleius in a provoking manner. And I, I, I quote, now in the name of the very gods about whom we are talking, what can be the meaning of this? For the gods are merely the result of mental processing and do not have any solidity or outline. What difference does it make if we think of a hypocenter of a god? Other philosophers call these rational construction, construction hollow imaginations, but you define it as a rival and penetration of the images into the soul. So uh, when I seem to see Tiberius Gracchus, who speaks at the capital, producing the ballot box, a ballot box voting to Marcus Octavius. I say that this impression is empty, while you say that the images of Gracchus and Octavius remain, so that when I arrive at the capital, these are forward into my soul. The same happens concerning God, the image of which repeatedly impacts upon souls. Thus, the gods are thought, thought of as happy and eternal. Since there is no image coming from nothing in the Epicurean doctrine, Gracchus Eidola remains somewhere in the capital after his death until someone perceives them, or Gracchus comes from somewhere emanating Eidola. Anyway, this Eidola must, be, must also be physical to affect Cicero's mind. On the gods, their light and fine Eidola are still physical images flowing from their divine bodies. But what about the hypocenter, the chimera, or other imaginary beings? Where do they come from? Where does everything that we have never seen come from if Epicurean doctrine denies the possibility of images originating from nothing, that is, incorporeal? Indeed, this is a significant epistemological difficulty of Epicureanism, as we can see in Lucretius book four, in the long passage. So it is interesting then to observe another expression in this letter, the Cicero's expression, Dia Noiticas Fantasias. Uh, Cicero saying that they are formed from the Adola in the same way as the images in mind. And it is a point even more complex. Usually translated as mental representation or mental picture, of, I, of, I, I do prefer intellectual images. Dianoiticas fantasias, according to the Thesaurus Lingua 
the right time does not appear in any other text. It is unpublished. So, but Diogenes Laertius, dealing with the theme of the Epicurean criterion, talks about fantastical epibolae tes dianoias. But it is a debatable attribution, probably a later, a later development of the Epicurean theology. Cicero links the, his Dianoiticas fantasias to the image created about absent or non-existent beings or objects in, within an Aristotelian flavor. Definitely, the articulation between vision and thought in the Epicurean doctrine raises difficulties in the explanations, explanation of many phenomena, such as memory, the evocation of the absent dreams, uh, the conception of a living being or a thing or a place that we have never seen, or uh, of uh, an incorporeal being, which can be better studied when we compare uh, this passage with uh, Lucretius' long development on the theme of vision and dream in the Natura Theorum, book four. For Cicero, vision is the faculty associated with mental perception and knowledge. Vision is dynamic, including perception and a reaction to it. It is undisputable that there is a platonic bias in Cicero's position. Cicero's position. However, it is lacking too deep Cicero's links with Aristotle's notion of idea, as in the Academica de Varro, né? 33, when he declares that the theory of ideas was the cause of the disagreement between Plato and Aristotle and argued for the positive links between the object seen or imagined, the eyes né? and the mind. Concluding, there are several points of interest in Cicero's critique of Epicurean theology in the Natura Theorum beyond uh, these epistemological difficulties, such as its failure to pass the scrutiny of common sense, not to say of the polemics against Epicurean resistance uh, regarding political involvement or the doctrine of pleasure or and the underestimation of rhetoric. In a word, uh, Epicurean gods had no part to play in the world, eternally enjoying the pleasure of inactivity, doing nothing but contemplating their own happiness. Epicurus gods would then be a kind of ideal for the sage. As we can see at the end of the letter to Menaces, uh, um, where uh, the, the sage will leave Hos, Theos, and Anthropos or as a god among men. In Cicero thoughts, these gods are not living gods, they are only concepts. They would be diaphanous, beautiful forms in the mind, offering nothing to the world. However, has got us heard, if the anthropomorphic shape of the gods matches Greek and Roman notions of the divine, it is not a natural datum, but has a historical origin. Human experience, not a generically given nature, ground human notions of the gods. Religious experience fixed the form and idea of the divinity. What has been taught and learned about the gods is the origin of the divine images in their infinite variations, notions according to different peoples. In other words, Cicero favors the links between the notion of the gods, the divine image, and the human experience of in the world. He discusses the origin of the divine images touching on sensitive points of the Epicurean doctrine that may also be perceived when we compare the De Natura de Oro with Philodemus de Pietate on the adjustment, difficult adjustment between, on the one hand, the proleptic, proleptic um, origin of the belief and the divine image, and on the other, the fact of the immense religious diversity. Of course, I only consider, considered Epicurean theology from Cicero's perspective, and he sometimes strategically misrepresents it or disregards relevant, disregard relevant development of this doctrine. But without Cicero, we would know very little about Epicurean thoughts. 
Nevertheless, the epistemological problem poses how to match the divine image proletically engraved in our minds with the broad range of divine names and material images detected in the world. For Cicero, there is no answer to this question in Epicurean theology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so Guillermina, Sara, and many others. So, who would like to <laughs> start, please? No, no, they are clapping. <laughs> they are just clapping. So, ah, only, only clapping. Okay, sorry. I always confuse with uh, clapping with the raised hand. Raised hand is. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> oh. Uh, any questions, comments? Basic comments or in Portuguese, in Italian, in Spanish? I will start. I will start. Otherwise, okay. Okay, Claudia. Thank you very much for this most interesting lecture. I'm no expert in Cicero, but he is really a crucial point in Roman philosophy, thought, history, uh, and many other fields. Um, you showed how he thinks, he reflects on Greek approaches, no? Greek philosophical approaches to, to the gods and to the um, philosophical matters, but still, even if he's a very refined thinker, he's a philosopher, he was everything. <laughs> we could say that the, the, the most complex, one of the most complex Roman thinkers and uh, writers, but it still remains up to a certain point deeply Roman as well. We, we, could say, we could say, because in this lecture, you showed us how he reflects on the conception of the gods, the anthropophism of the gods. And, and on the, in this regard, one of his sources, his main Roman source, apart from the Greek ones, is Varro, no? because the, 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 the very famous passage um, where, where he says that uh, uh, Varro showed us how uh, the, the, the way through, through for understanding Rome, no? he showed us the, the path, he showed, he showed us the way. And if, I, if I'm correct, I don't remember if it was in the lingua di but I think it was in the antiquities, there is a passage where Varro says that the first Roman temples, the first Roman cults were for not anthropomorphic um, gods. So this is also very interesting, you know, that you, you, you say that, that at, at the end, you know, that the anthropo anthropomorphic image of the gods is, is a, for, for Cicero more, more a, a historical process. So, so, so I would say that at, at the beginning of this process, there is a very Roman uh, conception. So, what Varro believes that the at the at the at the, um, at the beginning the Romans did not uh, worship anthropomorphic gods, and also that there were still at, at his times uh, gods, typically Roman gods, who were not really very well defined, and such as the Geni, such as the Lares, no that. Had an, an anthropomorphic, no? So I would say that he is at this crucial point of passage, no? And so this is not really a question, but I would like to, to, to know what you think about this. <laughs> because you are the expert, I'm not the expert of Cicero, so I would like to ask you. No, oh, but you, we need an expert with of Varro and Guillermina. <laughs> Guillermina is ah, here, baby, yeah. especially on this passage, no? uh, this passage that, uh, of Varro that uh, uh, declare uh, that uh, the, 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 the old, uh, the, the ancestors in the first Romans did not uh, have uh, tropomorphic gods. But it is quite, quite um, disputable. 
that if uh, it's not a coherent uh, uh, thinking, okay, argument, or because uh, Sylvia Estienne recently published an article discussing exactly this passage. And I had the, um, oh, felicitazione. <laughs> Ciao, Guige. Ciao, Guige. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, she, she um, showed, I, I have the pleasure of publishing uh, uh, her article uh, in the book. It's an open book, uh, a status in Roman religion. Uh, uh -huh. Is the, 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 the first, the first, no, the second, the first is Gisela, Giselis, uh, the first one. And she uh, uh, showed us that in the, the same place, the same fragments of our own, uh, uh, you can uh, perceive different legends of this, this idea. But um, to Cicero, uh, it's not only the case of the anthropomorphic images that uh, Greek and Roman anthropomorphic images that uh, uh, is coherent, uh, but another uh, other images also. And for example, the Egyptians and the Syrians plays a fundamental role in the Natura de Oro to criticize both the Epicurean um, idol gods uh, uh, as the stoic allegorical gods and so on. So, um, Cicero in the Natura de Oro is not exactly uh, interested in, 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 in discussing what the origin of the, their images uh, in the world, but the origin of the, the notion of the gods uh, in the mind uh, and the, the physical nature of the gods and the relation with uh, the relationship of uh, this nature, okay? with the diversity, it's a, a point of form. And he is a senator. He is a, 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 a pontiff and a senator. And he could not uh, deny that the diversity. And so he, 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 he calls the, the, Epicurean, uh, the, the, the Epicurean doctrine flawed in this sense. And the Stoics, it's a nonsense, a pretty nonsense. Uh, the, 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 for the, the, the gods, the gods, uh, uh, how can I say, the, the Roman traditional gods as just allegories. Mm -hmm. So they are not living gods. So they are not, uh, uh, neither uh, Epicureanism nor Stoicism mm -hmm. uh, matches or, 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 or or, or reach the necessity of Roman religion in this way. And this, I think, is a central point of Porter's uh, criticism of both, both uh, theories in debate, I suppose. This. But I don't know if I, if I reply you because yes. I'm not an expert of our <laughs> I do I know, not know. More, more to, to know more about this, uh, this, this matter, which I'm not an expert of so thank you very much there are thank you, thank you, two... i think eduardo eduardo sim sí. eduardo in portuguese if you want si, si. como queira fala conosco eduardo já não tá gravando mais perfeito <laughs> Uh, okay. uh, well, the first question is also about Stoicism. Uh, late Roman historians such as Esperus Briones pointed that the Greco-Roman paganism lost its track during the third century, uh, when original uh, Oriental cult and Neoplatonism became more preeminent. Roman Emperor Marco Aurelio was a well-known Stoic with a keen mind and intellectual activity. Knowing that at some point Stoicism became the opposing philosophical doctrine to Epicureanism, 
did that emperor do anything to rival the ideas of Cicero and the Epicureanism in an institutional level? Is there any relation between the decline of Epicureanism and the role of Aurelio? Yeah, uh, I don't think I mean, I'm not sure that the Epicureanism uh, suffered a uh, decline so high in the in the, the, the imperial period. It is a, a controversial point, a debatable point now. And uh, it's uh, very interesting uh, that this year uh, it was published a book, a collective book, very interesting called uh, Epicurus in Rome, okay, and marvelous book. So uh, they problematize the, 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 the authors problematize the question of Epicureanism in Rome, uh, and for example, and of course uh, uh, the, uh, its relationship or its how can I say controversy uh, with uh, stoicism, but also neoplatonism and so on. We have a uh, um, uh, uh, very, how can I say, edited uh, image of the, the, the nuances of the debates in, in, in every time in different age uh, periods in antiquity. For example, uh, in Cicero's times, uh, Epicureanism, I think, I suppose, it's much more spread than Stoicism. Uh, and even if we can uh, speak of uh, Cicero's dissent, this uh, dissenting, dissenting is correct, I suppose, dissenting uh, uh, with Epicureanism, he is grasping also, it is a title of Stefano Maso, né? Capire e dissentire. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but it was published uh, in, in the English translation in 2015 uh, with the title Grasp and Dissent. So Grasp and Dissent, it was, and he, he uh, uh, the, the relationship uh, with, uh, the, of Cicero, Cicero thinking with uh, the, the Epicurean thought is very subtle and very sophisticated also. Despite Epicureanism is a fundamental, an excellent tool to, 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 to rhetorical accommodation, of course. But uh, we need to put in the conversation yeah, all the or the uh, uh, schools. I, I don't. I don't know if we can speak of schools uh, exactly, uh, but a, a, a branch of thought like the the uh, neo Pythagoreanism uh, that we don't know many things. Uh, today there are many scholars studying and trying to recover the, the Pythagoreanism in Rome. And figures like, for example, Nigidius Figulus and others, now, because they were very popular. Also, we have uh, not evidence, uh, uh, clear evidence, but we have clues to think that there is many, many, many discussions and, and debates. And uh, in my view, now, and many others. <laughs> Well, uh, this kind of debates are not marginal to Roman religion. As for many, many uh, 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 um, uh, decades, uh, the, the, the scholars think of oh, no theology uh, doesn't matter to study uh, Roman religion. But now uh, I think many difficulties uh, are surpassing, and we can study theology or include some theological uh, concerns uh, in Roman religion. Uh, for example, just to 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 recommend another book and a very new book. He is not here, but he will be here with us 
soon. Uh, I just finished to read the new book of Federico Sant'Angelo. And there is a very nice, very nice chapter on, the, on, on questions of theology. Very nice, very, very good. And to be sure, uh, a book of this year, I just like to, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I know that there is many students here, PhD students and master students. So I, I like to recommend some books. Uh, and this year, I suppose this year or last year, last year, Katarina Folk uh, published a very nice book also, uh, The Roman Republic of Letters. Uh, so Eduardo, uh, I think you would like to read this book, okay, to, to um, sort of close to understand this kind of debate. Of course, I cannot speak about uh, the times of Marcus Aurelius. Um, I don't know, I think I always, I used to, to, to say that after Augustus, everything is modern history for me. <laughs> I have difficulty to understand the, 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 the nuances of thinking, but uh, uh, I, I do prefer not to, to speak about Marcus Aurelius, okay? Uh, it's not my, my speciality. I'm very Republican, <laughs> okay? Thank you, thank you, Edmar. So. Are there any other questions, comments? Next week we will we'll have, we will have a speak on uh, another branch of, of, of Roman religion and their important literature okay. uh, and the theological uh, elements of Roman poetry literature with Emilia, Emilia Kai. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so Claudia. everything is okay. Oi, yes. podemos Fal falar em português? Mas falamos em português. Eu, eu vou, em português. Mas, 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 para perguntar em italiano, porque não, vou, vou tentar em português. Italiano, italiano. Não, 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 okay. é... não eu entendo. Eu só não falo bem, mas entendo. Ok, mas é... atento antes em português e depois vou, vou tá. dizer em italiano também. É, você. É... Um, uh, um, disse que, que, que Cícero fala mu, muito, fala, menciona frequentemente também os deus uh, egit, egípcios do Egito. Uhum. Egípcios. Egípcios. Que, é que é, 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 sim, mas você disse também que ele eh, individua na 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 eh, no, os, os, os homens parece como, como, como os deus porque é, é, só uh, os homens têm razão. Ah, isso era veleios, né? Trazendo ah, veleios, a, okay. a, a, a visão é, ah, vista é, tá. para os estoicos, para Balbos, por exemplo, o deus é redondo. É a forma divina ah. perfeita é redonda. Ah, né? tá. Então, é o mundo, o universo, etc. Né? Uh, e, e, e desculpa não porque é, 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 é... Falta, de fato Cícero no de Natura de Ouro tá ele não ele não está presente ah. digamos assim ah então tá? ele é cota é, ah. e cota vai usar egípcios é, magos uh, uh, sírios e outros tá como um bom argumento, tá? os tipos de deuses, deuses concebidos de outra forma, inclusive apresentando a passagens que apresentam esses deuses dos, abre aspas, bárbaros, tá? 
como? Pra, é, 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 estimulando uma piedade maior do que ah. os próprios deuses romanos. Tá? Ah, Mas ah. isso é argumentação, eles estão debatendo. Ah, tá? ah. Então, tem uma série de elementos. Porque, ao mesmo tempo que Cota diz, olha, os egípcios, você já viu algum egípcio é, ferir um gato? Machucar um gato? Porque o gato é, é um deus, né? Um egípcio não vai fazer mal a um gato, mas, ao mesmo tempo, ele chama os discos dos egípcios é, que são ridículos também. Então, tem esse, esse jogo. É, né? é a cabeça do animal. É, mas, mas, enfim, eles são, um, 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 vamos dizer, um, um desafio epistemológico. Tá? Os deuses egípcios funcionam como um desafio, desafio, acho que, que eu faço em italiano, né? desafio epistemológico, porque o debate ali se move de dois, duas formas. Epicuristas, é, o Deleio, o epicurista, a meu ver, está falando em termos epistemológicos. Uhum. E Cota está falando em termos ontológicos. Uhum. Ele vem com problemas ontológicos contra a epistemologia. Ah. E aí o choque dá. Sabe? <risos> e é muito variado. Né? Aliás, a teologia epicurista ela não é cosmológica, né? porque ela não depende, por exemplo, os deuses não fazem parte da criação do mundo. Né? E, e o, o, no livro 2, você vê uma teologia cosmológica em ação. E aí Cota vai, vai entrar de outra forma, vai, 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 vai debater com outros critérios inclusive usando alguns elementos epistemológicos que ele não uhum. usou com no Cresce. Então, isso vai variando, mas, ao mesmo tempo, em termos para os estudos de religião romana, isso interessa sobremaneira, porque são debates que vão aparecer em outros autores. Você vai para Filodemo, Lucrécio, o pouco que temos... É, Sim, de, de outras coisas de Filodemo, sem ser o de Piedade, mas de, de Lucrécio de Varrão. Então, esses temas, eles estavam sendo debatidos. E pelos títulos que temos, os fragmentos, não eram só teoria, não. Não eram diversão teórica para quem está no final, de, de, sei lá, no, 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 num dia de feriado na sua vila. Tá? Essa, isso acabava sendo discutido. E aparecem nas cartas de Cícero, você veja, Cassius, para quem não percebeu o Cassius, é o Cassius do Brutus que mata César. Tá? E ele é um epicurista. Uhum. E o Brutus era um neoacadêmico. Então, e eles têm toda uma ligação com, com, com a, 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 o pensamento teórico, né? com a teoria, e mesmo com questões teológicas. Eles discutem em Cassius. Por isso, enfim... É... Um dos aspectos, o nosso seminário vai ter muitos aspectos, né? movimento ritual, espaço sagrado, literatura, mito. Né? Vamos ter diversos aspectos e alguns, alguns elementos da teologia elas vão fazendo parte disso. Né? Isso ah. não quer dizer, por exemplo, a Emília traz o, o, o Virgílio, semana que vem, né? e a ligação de Virgílio com o epicurismo, a meu ver, brigando com o epicurismo, mas usando o elemento do turismo é riquíssima, riquíssima. Né? Não sei se a Emília concorda, né? mas você percebe ele discutindo, parece que está discutindo com o Lucrécio, muitas vezes. Né? E isso é fundamental tá, para a gente conhecer isso, essa dinâmica cultural desse momento que, a meu ver, é um dos mais ricos da, do, da, da literatura romana e da, da experiência cultural romana, que é o século I antes da nossa era. É fantástico, é fantástico nesse ponto. Eu acho que outro momento assim, de grande rebuliço vai ser século III em diante. Assim, de uma grande, um grande rebuliço também, intelectual. Conhece a expressão rebuliço? Não. Como, Como é assim? que eu traduzo? Não. Rebuliço. Assim? Re, revira a volta. Aham. Uh -huh. Ah. E vira voltas e discussões e enfim né e disputas acirradas uhum. né? muito grande é uma pergunta é isso? Né, Ismael de Ismael ah fala Ismael fala também a gente quer ouvir sua voz bom 
Então, a minha pergunta é a seguinte, tá? Já que estamos falando em pensamento teológico romano, né? Tradicional e tudo mais. Até onde, Cláudio, que você acredita que, que esse pensamento teológico presente no mundo romano ali do, do século I, né? Pode ter influenciado aqueles primeiros pensadores cristãos, como, por exemplo, Paulo? Olha, eu não, não sei, assim, em termos de influência, mas tinha muito diálogo. Muito diálogo e a gente vê ecos de discussão é, de Paulo Jefferson, que está aqui, está estudando muito isso, né? Jefferson Santos, aqui presente. Né? Paulo, eu não conheço muito bem, mas eu posso dizer que estudei muito Tertuliano né? e Agostinho. E você vê todos esses temas com guinadas muito interessantes. Tá? Com, com é, vamos dizer, uma guinada de foco. Tá? Mas esses elementos aparecendo e sendo discutidos, inclusive os autores sendo discutidos. Porque se você quer buscar fragmentos, por exemplo, de Barrão, você vai para a Cidade de Deus. E outro, né? tem uma quantidade é, é muito grande. Inclusive, Agostinho diz, vamos ver se a gente acreditou não nele, né? que ele traz, que ele transcreve. Né? Mas o modo, a interpretação e o modo como ele disputa, mas não é só isso, é Ambrósio, por exemplo. Ambrósio é um dos, Ambrósio, o, o, é, é um dos principais pensadores e... É, 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 como é que eu vou dizer, e bispos né? e ativos né? no cristianismo, é Ambrósio. E Ambrósio é o primeiro, vai, vai, vai é, fazer um, um deofiquis dele, de Cícero, tá? com base em Cícero, e vai disputar muito. Então, é muito legal, muito legal. Arnobius também. Então, é, realmente, eles estão discutindo e esse é um debate que vai passar, tá? e que você vai ver ao longo da Idade Média e muitos termos, muita coisa se perde, e, e, e por aí vai, e ainda é um debate hoje. Essa questão aqui sobre, é, é, sobre qual é a natureza dos deuses né? e, e como é que a imagem dos deuses se cria na mente é uma questão que está sendo debatida hoje. Tá? E com todos os dogmatismos que estão voltando e que, que enfim, não? Estão voltando? Não, já voltaram. Já estão conosco. Pois é. Não sei se eu te respondi, mas é um estudo fantástico. Agora, é isso, precisa de muitas vidas para estudar tudo isso. Muitas vidas. Ou a literatura especializada, que é o que nos salva, né? E vai ouvindo e vai... Ok. Tem uma outra é, pergunta sobre Max, observações. Tchau, Rui. Não. Você está saindo porque tem aula agora na Uni uhum. Rio. Obrigada. Podemos então é. e vamos agora para a próxima semana com. Virgílio, né? Virgílio. Ok. Beníssimo. So, see, see you next Sim. Thursday. See you next week. Oh. Até yes. breve. Tchau, podemos Bye. encerrar, então. Uma boa semana para todos. A very nice week. Boa semana para todos. Até a próxima Bye. semana. Até a próxima. Boa semana. Tchau, tchau. Até mais. Tchau, tchau. Prazer em vê-los. Obrigada, tchau. Sara, por ter vindo. Seja bem-vinda aqui conosco. Obrigada. Semana que vem tchau. estarei aqui de novo. Bom te ver, Giorgio. Ah, bom te ver, Sara. Não sei se você lembra de Sarah mim. Sara de São Paulo. Claro que lembro. É, de é, São Paulo. É, lembro, é, lembro, lembro. lembro. Ah, que legal. Claro. Ah, Tiaguinho, obrigada. João, vou, Alice, vou acompanhar. Patrícia. Obrigada. E semana que vem temos Virgílio com Emília Cairo, de, lá de La Plata. Você vai eu vou acompanhar. Ah, que legal. E aí, e depois eu vou perguntar é, lá por, pelo e-mail como que faz para acessar uh, as gravações, porque eu perdi a do Giorgio, a apresentação do Giorgio. É, a gente ainda vai processar isso tudo. Por enquanto, está ah, só tá. guardando. Tá? Ok. <risos> Beleza. Ok. Quando tiver bye, disponível, bye, então. Tchau, tá tchau. Certo. Bye, tchau. Bye. tchau.
grande abraço, tchau. See you next week. Obrigada, Jojo. Tchau. Tchau, tchau Jean. Tchau, Patrícia.